ബാക്കിയെല്ലാവരും ഒന്ന് ഓഡിയോ അൺമ്യൂട്ട് ചെയ്യാവോ ും to the grand finale of bed meet international ug conference hosted by college union 2020 government medical college kolikod today we present to you the event symposium held in connection with med meet introducing myself i am raisa rani james first year mbbs government medical college kolikod and i will be the moderator for today's session today we have the eminent panel of judges introducing to you dr rose sevia assistant professor department of anatomy government medical college thrissur widely known all over india through her youtube channel life in the womb i welcome you ma'am to this event thank you raisa next i introduce to you our beloved dr ampli p ma'am associate professor department of anatomy government medical college kolikod known for her simple and conceptual teaching of anatomy of which i have also been a part of I welcome you ma'am to this event. Thank you. So before going further let me talk a word on the event. The event symposium was open to all first time students all over the country. It was welcomed with much appreciation and enthusiastic participation. In the first round the participants were asked to do a 5 minute long video presentation on previously assigned topics. out of which everybody did excellently well out of which 10 participants it was a tight selection 10 participants were selected and they have qualified to today's round today you will be seeing a 10 minute presentation of these participants of which for 8 minute they will be presenting and for 2 minutes judges will be analyzing them the topics have been given one day prior now before going on i'll tell the uh, general instructions all delegates in the meeting are requested to keep their audio and video on mute while the participants are presenting ma'am shall we call the first participant yes okay uh, the first participant will soon enter the meeting uh divya the first participant okay so the chess number 1 will enter soon i'll give a brief intro to them in intro to the uh, participant and i'll tell them to start chess number 1 chess number 1 chess number 1 am i audible yeah Okay so I need you to unmute your video and audio I have unmuted Okay so uh, Okay so uh, once you start presenting when you once you ready to present I'll start the time you will be you will be given 10 minutes I'll give you a warning at 7 minutes make sure that you don't present you don't your presentation does not exceed a duration of 8 minute or else you will be disqualified Okay you can start presenting now Tell me any topic Shall I start presenting right now? Yeah, yeah, you can start. I'm going to start the time. Okay. Okay. Good. 
गुड इवनिंग मैम इज माई स्क्रीन विजिबल your screen is visible you can skip to powerpoint good evening i am samyukta and i am going to present a symposium on the anl canal the anl canal is the continuation of rectum or the terminal part of gastrointestinal tract and begins at the recto anal junction it is 3.8 cm long and it is present in the anal triangle in the perineum it ends at the anal orifice it is always closed except during defecation and it is completely extra peritoneal relations the common relation the anterior common relation in male and female is the perineal body additionally in males there is bulb of penis and spongy urethra which is replaced by lower part of vagina in the female posterior relations are anococcygeal raphe tip of coccyx and fibro fatty tissue the lateral relations are right and left ischio anal fossae present on either side ano rectal sling Ano rectal sling is present at the ano rectal junction it demarcates the anal canal from the rectum the sling is formed by pubo rectalis muscle internal anal sphincter and the deep part of external anal sphincter in the resting state the ano rectal tube is angled forward and during the contracted state the angle straightens due to the downward intra abdominal force and this is facilitated by pubo rectalis muscle here we can see per rectal examination and in per rectal examination the flexed finger should be able to touch the ano rectal sling surgical excision of this sling leads to incontinence next coming to pectinate or dentate line the pectinate or dentate line is otherwise called as the watershed line due to the separate lymphatic drainage above and below the line it represents the embryological site of attachment of anal membrane this line divides the anal canal into an upper part and a lower part the upper part is insensitive and the lower part is sensitive to pain and temperature white line of hilton white line of hilton is represented by the anal intersphincteric groove as we can see here it is present between internal anal sphincter and the subcutaneous part of external anal sphincter white is white white line of hilton is named so because it lies between bluish pink area above and blackish skin below this bluish pink area gets its color due to dense venous plexuses then coming to upper anal canal upper anal canal is present above the pectinate line and is 15 mm in length it has three important features which are anal columns anal sinuses and anal valves anal columns are longitudinal mucosal folds 6 to 10 in number and it contains radicals of superior rectal vein anal sinuses are vertical recesses present between the anal columns anal valves are crescent shaped folds present between the anal columns tubular anal glands here as we can see in this diagram it is present in the submucosa and the ducts of tubular anal glands open into the floor of anal sinus these glands are occasionally infected and may act as a source of anal fistula coming to lower anal canal lower anal canal together is 23 mm in length it is again divided into an upper region and a lower region by white line of hilton the upper region is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and does not contain sweat and sebaceous gland the lower region is lined by keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with true skin having sweat and sebaceous gland internal anal sphincter it is a thick 
smooth muscle coat continuing above from rectum till the white line of hilton it surrounds only the upper two third of anal canal as we can see here in the in the diagram the internal anal sphincter is is gets its origin from the circular smooth muscle extending from rectum below and below the white line of hilton it is not there and it is a smooth muscle involuntary and it gets its nerve supply from the autonomic nervous system external anal sphincter it is a skeletal muscle and a voluntary muscle it has three parts which are deep superficial and subcutaneous part which are labeled 1 2 and 3 respectively in the diagram it receives its somatic nerve of nerve supply from inferior rectal nerve and perineal branch of fourth sacral nerve surgical spaces there are three surgical spaces first one is the ischio anal space which is present on either side of the anal canal right and left and it is filled with fat perianal space is the space present between perianal fascia and skin it contains external venous plexus submucous space of anal canal is present above the white line of hilton and between internal anal sphincter and the mucous membrane it contains internal venous plexus coming to blood supply the arterial supply of the upper part of anal canal is by superior rectal artery and the lower part gets its arterial supply from inferior rectal artery as we can see here there is pubo rectalis muscle which demarcates anal canal from rectum venous drainage the upper part is drained by superior rectal vein lower part by inferior rectal vein superior rectal vein drains into the portal venous system whereas inferior rectal vein drains into the caval system therefore this is an important site of porto caval anastomosis coming to lymphatics the upper part that is the part of anal canal above the pectinate line is drained by internal iliac nerves and para rectal nerves and the part of anal canal below pectinate line is drained into superficial inguinal nodes coming to the nerve supply the upper part receives its nerve supply from inferior hypogastric plexus and lower part from inferior rectal nerve which is a branch of pudendal nerve coming to development and congenital anomalies the upper half is endodermal in origin and develops from pri primitive rectum lower half is ectodermal in origin and arises from proctodium or anal pit the upper half and lower half are connected by the anal membrane which disappears at the end of seventh week of intrauterine life congenital anomalies seen are congenital megacolon which is otherwise called hirschsprung disease imperforate anus and rectal fistula in congenital megacolon there is a dilatation of the colon that is distal part is imperforate anus there is an in, in a, there is no connection between the terminal part of gut to the exterior fistula there is a tubular connection on both sides with rectum either with the urethra or vagina or the urinary bladder the various anal disorders are internal hemorrhoids external hemorrhoids which are Fall spiles respect, and there are fistula, anal, and anal. Thank you. The judges, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Are you? <laughs> This you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Amri Madam, you can ask. Uh, Sanjita, it was a nice presentation. You covered almost everything. And uh, can you tell me uh, what is the difference? Can you dif uh, any difference between internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids? Internal hemorrhoids is formed above the pectinate line, and external hemorrhoids is formed below the pectinate line. 
internal hemorrhoids are sacular dilatations of superior rectal vein and the external hemorrhoids otherwise called false piles is due to the dilatation of inferior rectal vein each pile has a covering of mucosa submucosa radical of uh, of the rectal vein and the uh, terminal part of the artery okay which of these will be enlarged in portosystemic uh, hypertension in portal hypertension in portosystemic portal hypertension in portosystemic uh, hypertension there will not be hemorrhoids and more commonly we will be able to see anorectal varices which are the dilatations of veins in the collateral veins present in the submucosa okay very good to your roof okay anyway it was really very nice presentation i would like to ask uh three questions the first one is you mentioned about the anorectal sleep isn't it uh do you know the investigation done to assess this angle um the angle is usually 90 degree in the resting state do you know any investigation done particularly for this it's a magnetic resonance imaging okay ma'am you know the term Look, you know, you know the term used. No. I know the term, but I don't know that that this is associated with MRI. Uh, what was the term which you got to know? Magnetic resonance imaging. Yes, the particular test done for this, you know. Have mm -hmm. you heard about uh, difficogram? Hmm? Difficogram. Have you heard about that? No, no. It's okay. You can go and refer. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned about the superior rectal artery, isn't it? What is it a branch of? Su superior rectal artery is the continuation of inferior mesenteric artery. Very good. Then you mentioned about congenital megacolon, right? Yes, ma'am. So, what's the name given to that? Hirschsprung disease. Uh, what is the main pathology behind? Uh, it is due to the failure of. Uh, migration of neural crest cells and therefore parasympathetic ganglia are absent there and therefore there will be difficulty in the distension and passing of feces very good i think madam we can wind up right uh, yes okay thank you thank you ma'am okay so just number 1 can i just go leave the meeting ma'am shall i let just number 2 under the meeting no uh, yes just number 1 make sure you mute your video and audio okay thank you Test number two. Test number two. Test number two. Am I audible? Hello. Okay. So, uh, once you start presenting, I'll start the timer. Okay. Uh. So. Okay. One second. I'll give you warning. It's seven minutes. Make sure you hear that. Okay, don't exceed over eight minutes, or else you'll be you'll be disqualified. Thank you. Okay. Let me start screen sharing. Okay. Once you start screen sharing, I'll start. I'll set the timer. Good morning. Uh, good evening, judges, uh, my fellow competitors, and the audience. My name is Aditya Singh, and I'm chest number two to uh, two. Today, I'll be talking about the abdominal aorta. now you must notice that there is a number written here 3353 well this will be required a bit later on so it would be nice if you would remember this for now now why is this topic worth our time why is it so important this is because the entire arterial supply of the abdomen is derived from the abdominal aorta and subsequently even the pelvis and the lower limbs which makes this artery uh, an artery of prime importance also aortic aneurysms occur at a specific position most commonly inside the abdominal aorta we'll be talking about them later on now we'll be studying this topic under these four headings out of which the branches are the most important now first of all talking about the extent and measurements of the abdominal aorta now we know that the abdominal aorta is a direct continuation of the descending thoracic aorta at the aortic orifice of the diaphragm now this is located a bit towards the left of the vertebral column and anterior to it it enters at the level of t12 to l1 and terminates at the level of the lower border of l4 
by dividing into the two common iliac arteries. The length of the abdominal aorta is mostly 10 to 11 centimeters and the diameter about 20 millimeters. Now the relation. Now, as I said, the abdominal aorta is located anteriorly to the vertebral column. Therefore, uh, the posterior relations would be the bodies of the lumbar vertebra and the interventricular disc, the anterior longitudinal ligament, and the third and fourth left lumbar veins. Anteriorly, the abdominal aorta is covered by a lot of visceral organs. So these can include the uh, pancreas and spleen, the left renal vein, which is crossing from the right side to the left side, then the third part of the duodenum, which is the horizontal part, the root of the mesentery, lots of coils of the small intestine. On the right side, we can see the inferior vena cava ascending up, and on the left side, the left sympathetic trunk. Now coming to the branches. Now here we are met again with 3353. Three, what is this? 3 is the three anterior unpaired branches to the viscera. These mainly supply the gut. The next three is the three lateral paired branches to the viscera. Then five are the five lateral paired branches to the parietes at the posterior abdominal wall and the three terminal branches. First talking about the three unpaired arteries. Now embryologically speaking, the gut is divided into three parts, the foregut, midgut and the hindgut. And the arterial supply is based upon this. The foregut is supplied by the celiac trunk, the midgut by the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut by the inferior mesenteric artery. Now, the celiac trunk is the smallest uh, branch of the abdominal aorta. It arises just after it enters into the abdomen, and is uh, its origin is uh, uh, between T12 and L1 intervertebral disc. Uh, uh, the next one is this superior mesenteric artery, which arises about half an inch below the celiac trunk, at the level of L1 and it is sandwiched between the splenic vein and the left renal vein. Then the inferior mesenteric artery arises at the level of L3, about 4 cm above the bifurcation of the aorta. We will be talking in detail about the celiac trunk. As I said, it divides into the three terminal branches, first of which and the smallest of which is the left gastric artery. Now this supply, this goes around the lesser curvature of the stomach uh, after turning around the cardiac end. Next and the largest branch is the splenic artery. The splenic artery uh, mainly supplies the spleen by dividing into segmental branches. It is more, runs mostly horizontally uh, behind the stomach and is very tortuous to allow for distension of the stomach. It has lots of pancreatic branches, including the dorsal pancreatic artery, the great pancreatic artery, which runs along with the common bile duct, and the caudal pancreatic arteries. One of these caudal pancreatic arteries is the inferior pancreatic artery. Now, there are some short gastric arteries which supply the fundic region of the stomach also. The left gastroepiploic artery runs along the greater curvature of the stomach and ends by anastomosing with the right gastroepiploic artery. On the right side, we have the liver and the duodenum and the head of the pancreas. These are supplied by branches from the common hepatic artery. This divides into three branches the hepatic artery, the uh, gastroduodenal artery, and the right gastric artery. The gastroduodenal artery further divides into the superior pancreatic or duodenal artery, which is, supplies the pancreas and the duodenum, and the right gastroepiploic artery. Now coming to the three paired lateral arteries to the viscera. Which are these visceral organs? They are the suprarenal glands, the kidneys, and the gonads. To the suprarenal, the direct branch is the middle suprarenal artery, which runs laterally after originating, originating at the level of the superior mesenteric artery. Now, this anastomosis with the superior and inferior suprarenal arteries and then supplies the adrenal glands. The renal artery originates at the level of L2 and uh, it moves laterally. We can then notice that the uh, left one is a bit higher and the right one is a bit longer. This is because the abdominal aorta is located a bit towards the left side. It also gives origin to the inferior suprarenal artery, which joins the middle suprarenal artery. The gonads are supplied by the testicular and the ovarian arteries, these ones. Now talking about the five paired arteries to the parietes. First one and the first branch of the abdominal aorta is the inferior phrenic arteries. These cross the crux of the abdomen, crux of the abdomen, sorry, crust of the diaphragm and move upwards. These then supply the diaphragm. These also provide the superior suprarenal artery. There are also four pairs of uh, lumbar arteries on each side. 
which supply the posterior abdominal wall and the muscles and some arteries go into even into the spinal cord the three terminal branches are the common iliac artery which move down and at the sacroiliac joint they divide into the external and internal iliac artery there is also median sacral artery which arises from posterior uh, from behind the aorta and these anastomose with the lateral sacral artery now coming to the applied aspects aortic aneurysm is a permanent irreversible dilatation of the aorta and these are very dangerous because if they rupture they can cause a lot of internal bleeding uh, these occur due to the uh, weakening of the aortic wall the most common site of these aortic aneurysm is sir over you can press it for one more minute thank you okay. below the uh, origin of the renal artery the pulsations of the aorta can be palpated above the umbilicus towards the left side now the artery of adam kiewitz is a spinal artery which arises from the upper lumbar arteries and supplies the spinal cord now this is surgically important because during the uh, in, uh, uh, thoraco or abdominal interventions of the uh, aorta the, it needs to be taken care of that this artery is not injured otherwise it would can lead to ischemia of the spinal cord thank you i leave you with 3353 again thank you should i stop presenting yeah no you can stop presenting okay uh, okay aditya can you hear ha ah, good evening ma'am okay is there an investigation to uh, see the abdominal aorta and its branches is it visible in normal uh, x rays uh, no ma'am we need to inject the dye into the blood to be able to visualize the branches of the aorta Okay, have you reached the abdominal aorta, and have you this dye reached the abdominal aorta, and how can you see all these branches? Sorry, ma'am. How will this dye be injected into the abdominal aorta? Okay. What is uh, the route? This can, this can be injected into the radial artery, I suppose. <laughs> and? And then, oh, okay. So, uh, no. You can think of a more not the radial artery, huh? not the radial artery. Uh, hmm. Can be injected into the radial vein, then uh, it will go upwards and into the heart. Then uh, through so the very very complicated route to see the abdominal sorry, artery. Sorry. Uh, the radial artery goes up into the sorry. Oh God. In the upper limb. There is, you, there is no radial. There is a cephalic vein and the basilic vein, but we can inject it into the basilic vein, which will go up. Uh, oh. Leave the uh, upper limb. Yes. Can you think okay. of something related to lower limb? Ah. That also okay. is easily accessible. Okay. Femoral artery. Yes. Okay. You so, told me uh, that then. Okay. Second question. you told there is a median branch a median branch called median sacral artery yes okay does it have any developmental significance with the aorta ha ah, it is the uh, remnant of the older aorta found in lower animal no where is uh, aorta develops from oh uh, the dorsal aorta dorsal aorta okay So yeah, this is the remnant of the uh, right dorsal aorta. Okay. Uh, okay. And are you expecting these branches? It is to be like that every time in all these persons. Ah, uh, sorry. You said me about some visceral branches, paired, unpaired, ah, huh? the all that. And are you expecting it to be the same in all the pair persons? Yes, and there can be variations among people. For example, the testicular artery can often originate from the renal artery sometimes. Okay. Okay. And and the middle uh, suprarenal artery can also originate from the renal artery at times. Okay. Okay. Over to you, Rose.
Rose, uh, unmute your audience, please. Okay. Hi, Aditya. It was really a very nice presentation with a lot of animations at your level. I never expected it from undergraduates. Okay. Uh, then uh, you mentioned about uh, the relations of the branches of the abdominal aorta. Okay. So do you remember the main vascular structure lying between the abdominal aorta and the superior mesenteric artery? Oh, yes. Uh, An important vascular structure. Uh, mm, uh, this vein. And can you repeat the uh, superior mesenteric artery and the uh, abdominal aorta? Um, there the is a vein. Renal vein, yes, the left renal vein. Okay. Uh, do you know any clinical significance for that? Sometimes it will be crushed between these two major vessels. And do you know the syndrome? Name of the syndrome? No, ma'am. Have you heard about nutcracker syndrome? No, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, you can go and read about it. Then, uh, have you heard about horseshoe kidney? Ah, yes, ma'am. When the two kidneys fuse during development, and then okay. they get stuck in the uh, inferior mesenteric artery while ascending up, it forms a, this is a horseshoe kidney. Okay. So why is it uh, getting stuck up at the level of inferior mesenteric artery? Uh, while the, ki the kidney is actually a pelvic organ, so it ascends up uh, during the embryological development. And since the inferior mesenteric artery is the first uh, anterior artery, therefore while ascending, this joint between the two uh, kidneys gets stuck. Okay, very good. I think my name is okay. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, chest number two. Uh, if you want, you can stay back or you can leave the meeting. Ma'am, chest number two, you can mute yourself. Okay, chest number three, am I audible? Chest number three. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah you're audible. Shall I start presenting my screen? Yeah, once you start presenting your screen, I'll set the timer. Okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, you can start. Is my screen visible? Yes, your screen is visible. Yeah, so I'm starting now. Yeah. Good evening, respected judges and everyone. I'm Ritwik, chest number three, and the topic I'm going to present is internal capsule. So what is internal capsule? So internal capsule is a compact bundle of projection fibers present between thalamus and caudate nucleus medially and the lentiform nucleus laterally. When taken a section, it appears in the V shape, as we can see in this figure. They, these fibers are ascending, which are sensory, and descending, which are motor. These fibers fan out rostrally to form corona radiata and condense caudally and continue as crust cerebri in the midbrain. Now, what are the parts of internal capsule? Internal capsule is divided into five parts and they are the anterior limb, which is present between the caudate nucleus and the anterior part of lentiform nucleus, the posterior limb, which is present between the thalamus and the posterior part of lentiform nucleus, the genu, which interconnects these both, and then comes the retro lentiform part, which is present behind the lentiform nucleus, and the sub lentiform part, which is present below the lentiform nucleus. As you can see here, the hair from the, comes out from different areas of the scalp, which is bundled together and then continues as a pony. Similarly, these fibers, which come out from different parts of the cerebral cortex, get compactly arranged in between these nuclei, which is nothing but the internal capsule, which later continues as crust cerebra in the midbrain. As we, as we have discussed, now comes the motor fibers. So what are motor fibers? What are the types? These are corticopontine fibers, pyramidal fibers, and extra pyramidal fibers. So corticopontine fibers are frontopontine, peritopontine, occipitopontine, and temporopontine. As the name suggests, that's where the, they reach to. And the pyramidal fibers are corticonuclear and corticospinal. And the extra pyramidal fibers are corticorubral, corticostriate, and corticonegral, etc. Now, corticopontine fibers. These originate from different all lobes of cerebral cortex, and they form the single largest group of projection fibers. They almost form two-third part of the projection fibers. 
they have pont frontal pontine fibers are present in the anterior limb, genu, and the posterior limb. The parietopontine fiber and the occipitopontine fibers are present in the lateroventiform part, and the temporopontine fibers are present in the sublentiform part. They synapse in the ipsilateral part of pontine nuclei, and these fibers cross the midline and relay into the cortex of opposite cerebellar hemisphere, thus forming corticopontocerebellar pathway, which is recent development as well as highly developed in man. And then comes the pyramidal fibers. They are corticonuclear fibers which are present in the genu as well as the posterior limb. These synapse with the contralateral motor nuclei of the, of the cranial nerves which innervate the head and neck muscle. As we can see here, this is the corticonuclear fibers. And then comes the corticospinal fibers which is present in the posterior limb. They synapse with the anterior horn cells of the opposite half of the spinal cord and which innervate upper limb, trunk and lower limb. They are present in the anterior two-third part of the posterior limb. As we can see here, this anterior most one supplies to the upper limb, then, come, then these fibers supply to the trunk and the posterior most supply to the lower limb. And then come the extra pyramidal fibers. These relay into the basal ganglia with red nucleus, cortic, uh, corpus striatum and substantia nigra. As the name suggests, are the fibers. The corticorubral fibers, corticostriate fibers, and corticonigral fibers. Most of these fibers occupy positions near the corticospinal fibers in the posterior limb. As we can see here, here is a corticorubral tract, which is present in the posterior limb. Therefore, any lesion in the posterior limb also affects the extra pyramidal fibers. And then come sensory fibers. Sensory fibers are those fibers which carry sensory impulses from the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex. Sensory fibers are mostly thalamocortical fibers. And these fibers radiate from the thalamus to all directions, forming thalamic radiations. And even occasionally, corticothalamic fibers as well contribute to these thalamic radiations. And these are mostly third order sensory neurons, which carry sensory, path, sensory impulses. As you can see here, this is the anterior thalamic radiation, which will be present in the anterior limb. This is the superior thalamic radiation, which is present in the genu and the posterior limb. And this is the posterior thalamic radiation, which is generally present in the retrolentiform part. And this is the inferior thalamic radiation, which is present in the sublentiform part. Now, sensory fibers. So there are four types of sensory fibers, as we just saw. And the anterior thalamic radiation connects the anterior and the dorsomedial nuclei to the frontal lobe cortex. The superior thalamic radiation connects the ventral tire of thalamic nuclei to the frontal and parietal lobe of cortex. And the posterior thalamic radiation forms the optic radiation, which connects the lateral geniculate body, which is here, to the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe, as we can see here. And the inferior thalamic radiation forms the auditory radiation, which connects the medial geniculate body to the primary auditory area of the temporal, temporal lobe. Now, blood supply. So, cerebrum has blood supply from the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery, which are the branches of internal carotid artery, and the posterior cerebral artery, which is a branch of vertebral artery. As we can see here, this is the anterior cerebral artery, and this is the middle cerebral artery, which are the branches of internal carotid artery. And this is the vertebral artery giving up the branch called posterior cerebral artery. Now, going into the details, the anterior limb gets its supply from striate branch and the recurrent branch, which is a Huberner's artery, which is of importance of anterior uh, cerebral artery, and the striate branch, Charcot's artery of medial cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery. And the genu gets its blood supply from recurrent branch of uh, anterior cerebral artery, striate branch from the middle cerebral artery, and direct branches from the internal carotid artery. The posterior limb gets its supply from the striate branch of middle cerebral artery, which is a charcoal artery, which is of clinical importance, and the anterior choroidal artery of ICA, which is also of a clinical importance, and the posterior lateral branches and the posterior communicating artery of posterior cerebral artery. And the sublentiform part gets its supply from the anterior choroidal artery of internal carotid artery and the posterior lateral branches of posterior cerebral artery. The retrorentiform part gets its supply from the posterior lateral branches of the posterior cerebral artery. So, coming to the clinical aspects, uh, Charcot's artery is also called Charcot's artery of cerebral hemorrhage because its hemorrhage or infarction leads to the loss of sensations as well as or, or spastic paralysis on the opposite half of the body, which is called contralateral hemiplegia. As we can see in this picture, the upper limb and lower limb is flexed and the sensation is lost on that half of the body. And then comes the anterior choroidal artery, which is also called anterior choroidal artery of thrombosis. Because its lumen is very narrow, its thrombosis leads also affects and causes lesions in the posterior one third of the posterior limb, thereby affecting the visual as well as auditory uh, loss of hearing. It causes defects. And involvement of recurrent artery of Huberner's due to thrombosis or rupture results in paralysis of face and upper limb on the opposite side. To summarize, the internal capsule is a bundle of 
projection fibers which appears in v-shape in section it consists of five regions which are anterior limb genu the posterior limb the retro lentiform and the sub lentiform and they consist of paramilts are over okay and the and they consist of sensory as well as the motor fibers and coming to the arterial supply they are supplied with the anterior cerebral artery the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery and occasionally few direct branches from the internal carotid artery as well and clinical aspects include clinical aspects include the charcot's artery of hemorrhage and the anterior choroidal artery of thrombosis which can cause which whose thrombosis or hemorrhage can cause uh, paralysis as well as loss of sensations these are the references i went through thank you Thank you, Rick. Again, it is a very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, in a short time, we covered most everything. Yes, ma'am. So, good thing. And uh, let me ask you: Is there any other projection fibers in our brain? Uh, projection fibers. Yes, ma'am. Like most of the projection fibers are actually passed through the internal capsule, but there are also few projection fibers which are also present in the external capsule as well. Okay. Any in other than this new cerebrum? Um, uh, uh, from, sorry, ma'am. Why is it called internal capsule and external capsule like that? Yes, ma'am. It is called internal capsule because it is the mite matter which is present on the or which covers the lentiform nucleus on the medial side, and there is a thin strip of white matter which continue, which covers the lentiform nucleus on the lateral side as well, which is the external nucleus, and beyond which there is claustrum, which is present, and after that is present the extreme capsule. Okay, so you are telling all these capsules relate in relation to the lentiform nucleus, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, uh, you told me all these fibers are going through uh, the internal capsule consists of third order neuron. Is there any yes. exception? Uh, yes, ma'am. There are few exceptions. Uh, like uh, uh, the the actually the. Uh, cortical rubral and few other fibers directly relay into the cortex ma'am oh, are you talking about these motor fibers are directly coming from the cortex motor and going cortex. through the internal capsule internal capsule the sensory and yes third order neurons are all uh, related to sensory sensory, sensory. sensory yes ma'am so all these sensory fibers are coming and related uh, relate through these as a third order neurons yes ma'am no ma'am there are few exceptions as well but most of them are third order okay then you told uh, some branches are striate branches Right, they are called striate. Uh, they are called striate branches because uh, uh, they, they those are the branches which actually uh, uh, which uh, sorry. Okay, it's okay. Okay, uh, now Rose. Okay, uh, that's it. Anyway, nice presentation within a short period of time because we know internal capsule we usually take for more than one hour, isn't it, madam? So, yeah. so actually finished it within ten minutes. That's a great thing. Uh, then uh, you mentioned what are the other type of fibers apart from the projection fibers? You know, uh, there are actually association fibers as well as commensurate fibers, ma'am. Can you name one structure where uh, all these three types of fibers are seen? Uh, yes, ma'am. All all these three types of fibers are seen in. Uh, they are seen in corpus callosum above the corpus callosum now is there any other fiber other than this association fibers in corpus callosum so, commissural fibers is a commissural fibers what is that an example for corpus callosum ma'am corpus callosum is an example for what type of fibers commissural fibers okay Is there any structure where you get all the three types of fibers? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know. Am I able to recall? You can think about it. Now uh, you mentioned about the three cere. Uh, which are the three cerebral vessels? You know, supplying the brain as such. Anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and the posterior cerebral artery. Okay. Out of these three cerebral, which is the dominating artery in the uh, internal capsule? It's the middle cerebral artery, ma'am. Uh, what is the investigation done in order to know the pathology? Uh, generally, the uh, MRI can be done, ma'am. MRI gives us an idea about hemorrhage. MRI what? MRI of the 
brain gives us an idea. Are you brain? Yes, ma'am. Or I mean, she's asking about the vessel. What is the special investigation done to see if there is any thrombosis, embolism? You were mentioning about all these things, right? Yes, ma'am. I was mentioning. So for that, any special investigation? Uh, sorry, ma'am. I have no exact idea about it. And it was really a very nice presentation. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Can either side continue the meeting or leave the meeting? Okay. Just number four. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you're audible. Uh, okay, so your chest number four. Um, okay, I'll start the timer when you start presenting. Ma'am, pardon. I, I will start the timer when you start presenting. Am I audible? Yes, you now you're audible. Okay. Okay, I will give you a warning. A call at seven minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Make sure that you don't exceed uh, eight minutes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can start presenting now. Uh, ma'am, is my screen visible, ma'am? Ma'am? Yes, your screen is visible. Yes, your screen is visible. Can I start, ma'am? Yes, you can start. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Megashi, chest number four, to present to you about the diaphragm. So, uh, start with the introduction. Diaphragm is a dome shaped muscle forming the partition between the thoracic and abdominal cavities, which is a stiff muscle of respiration. The muscle fibers form the periphery of the partition and inserted into the central fibrous tendon. To so talk about the relations of the diaphragm, superiorly it is related to the pleura and the pericardium, inferiorly to the peritoneum, liver, fundus of stomach, spleen, kidney, and the, uh, and the supra renals. To talk about the origin, it can be divided into three parts. The sternal part, the costal part, and the vertebral part. Sternal part, two fleshy slits arising from the posterior surface of the zygoid process. Costal part, six fleshy slits arising from the inner surface of lower six ribs near their costal cartilage. The vertebral part can be still divided into right and left crura of the diaphragm and five arcuate ligaments. The right crust, it is a vertical fleshy bundle which arises from the right side of an anterior aspect of upper three lumbar vertebra and intervening intervertebral disc. The left crust is also similar to that, but the upper two lumbar vertebra gives origin to it. The median arcuate ligament. It is an arched fibrous band stretching between the two crusts. The medial arcuate ligament. It is the thickened upper portion of the psoas major muscle. It arises from the body of L2 to the tip of the transverse process of L1. The lateral arcuate ligament. It is the thickening. It is... It is a thickening that is formed by the um, it is formed by the fascia covering the quadratus lumborum. It extends from the tip of the transverse process of L1 to the 12th rib. The muscle fibers they are circumferential in origin. They are upwards and inwards and form the right and left dome to be attached in the central tendon. Central tendon is trifoliate in shape. That is, it has an anterior leaflet and two posterior leaflets. It is inseparably fused with the fibrous pericardium. To talk about the openings of the diaphragm, it has three major openings, the vena cavel, esophageal and aortic. 
the vena cava opening is present at the level of T8 thoracic vertebra and it is present at the central tendon slightly to the right of the median plane. Structures passing through it are IVC and right phrenic nerve. The esophageal opening is present at the level of T10 thoracic vertebra. It is slightly to the left of the median plane. Fibers of the right cross split around it and form a pinch cock like structure. The structures passing through it are esophagus, right and left vagal branches and esophageal branches of left gastric artery. Aortic opening. It is present at the level of T12 vertebra in the midline but behind the median narcoate ligament. The structures passing through it are acygos vein, thoracic duct and aorta. Other minor openings are also present in the diaphragm, namely the superior epigastric vessels passing through the space of larry. The musculophrenic vessel which exit between the 7th and 8th costal car cartilages. The lower 5 intercostal nerves here, they pass through the adjacent costal slip. The subcostal nerves and vessels lie deep to the lateral arcuate ligament, whereas the sympathetic chain lies deep to the medial arcuate ligament. Similarly, greater and lesser spanklick nerves pierce their respective crura and hemiacegos vein uh, pierces the left crust. To talk about the arterial supply, it is supplied by the superior and inferior phrenic arteries here from the abdominal aorta and the branches of internal thoracic arteries like pericardiophrenic artery, musculophrenic and the superior epigastric arteries. Lower five intercostal and subcostal arteries also supply them. To talk about the venous drainage, veins are generally corresponding to the arteries. Those veins in turn drain into the brachiocephalic vein in the neck, acygo system of veins and abdominal veins. Lymphatic drainage. The diaphragm has diaphragmatic lymph nodes anteriorly behind the Z-fold process, posteriorly near the aortic opening, to the right near the caval opening, and the left near the esophageal opening. The innervation of the diaphragm. Motor supply. The sole motor supply of diaphragm is the phrenic nerve, which has a root value of C3, C4, and C5. But sensory supply differs a little bit. That is, the central part is supplied by the phrenic nerve, and the periphery of the diaphragm is supplied by the lower six thoracic nerves. Action of the diaphragm. We know that the uh, main muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. During inspiration, it contracts and descends. During expiration, it relaxes and ascends. Take a note of this video. You can note the change in the thoracic volume while the diaphragm contracts now and relaxes during inspiration and uh, expiration. It is also a muscle of abdominal staining and increases the intra-abdominal pressure. It also helps in weight lifting by supporting the vertebral column. It acts as a thoracomuscular pump by which uh, it, it can decrease the intrathoracic pressure and at the same time it increases the uh, intra-abdominal pressure because of which it compresses the IVC and blood is forced into the right ventricle. It also acts as a sphincter for the esophagus. Development of the diaphragm. Diaphragm develops in the neck region from the following four structures. Ventrally, the septum transversum which forms the central tendon of diaphragm to the side, the pleuroperitoneal membrane which develops into the domes of the diaphragm. Dorsally, we have the dorsal mesentery of esophagus which develops into the dot, uh, diaphragmatic part that is surrounding the esophagus and to the periphery we have the body walls which gives rise to the peripheral part of the diaphragm. Now coming to the clinical correlation. Hiccups. It is due to the involuntary spasmodic contraction of diaphragm accompanied by the closing of glottis. Normally, it happens after uh, eating or drinking because of gastric irritation. It may also occur due to hysteria. Shoulder tip pain. It is irritation of the diaphragm uh, may also be referred in the shoulder because both the phrenic nerve and the supraclavicular nerve have the same root value C3, C4 and C5. The diaphragmatic paralysis. Uh, in cases where there is unilateral lesions of the phrenic nerve, one side of the diaphragm is slightly is, is paralyzed and it can be viewed as paradoxical breathing and elevated hemidiaphragm in an x-ray. The most important thing to study about uh, uh, when we study about diaphragm or the diaphragmatic hernia, there are two types, congenital and acquired. First, going on with the congenital hernias, we have postulateral hernia. It occurs due to the failure of the fusion of the pleuroperitoneal membrane because of which the herniation of the abdominal content into the thoracic cavity and compresses the heart and the lung. It is the commonest congenital diaphragmatic hernia. It occurs through the foramen, known as foramen of book the leg. The retrosternal hernia. It occurs through the gap between the muscular slip of the sternum and the seventh coastal cartilage to the foramen called foramen of morgagne. The paraesophageal hernia. It is a defect in the diaphragm because of which the anterior part of the stomach rolls upward and becomes upside down. But you can see the normal relation of gastroesophageal junction is not at all disturbed. Acquired hernia. The traumatic hernia. It may be due to a penetrating wound, accident, which can cause an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. Hiatal hernia. Seven minutes over.
Seven minutes over. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. It is a chiral hernia. It is the commonest of all the hernias, in which the gastroesophageal junction and the cardiac end of the stomach slides up into the thoracic cavity. It may be due to the weakness of the diaphragmatic muscle. You can here you can see the gastroesophageal junction uh, relation is disrupted because of which it may cause regurgitation of acid and patient may complain of heartburn. So these are the references uh, which I took from. Thank you everyone. Ma'am, should I uh, stop screening now? Yeah, you can stop your presentation. Uh, one minute. Okay, make a screen. Okay, tell me if there is any. Uh, you told me the sensory innervation of the central part and the periphery of the diaphragm is different. Does it have any developmental correlation? Yes, ma'am. First, diaphragm develops in the region of neck, ma'am, because phrenic nerve is a nerve of neck. Uh, it develops near the somites of C3, C4, and C5. Due to the development of heart, enlargement of uh, pleura, uh, and all, it descends to the thoracoabdominal region where it is present in the adult, ma'am. So, uh, no, it, the nerve is being dragged from there to the abdominal region, ma'am. Okay, very good. Then, what is the uh, its function? How does it function as an esophageal sphincter? You told me there is some sphincteric action on the esophagus. Can you explain? Uh, it, it acts uh, the my fibers from the right crest are around the esophagus, ma'am, which may act as a sphincter. During inspiration and uh, during inspiration, it contracts and it may close the e esophagus. Yes, esophageal opening is it on the right side or left side or in the central part of the diaphragm? It is towards the left side, ma'am. Okay, it is towards, towards the, the left side, but it is covered by, surrounded by the right crust. Yeah, yes, ma'am, right crust fibers, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Okay, it was really a nice presentation. Uh, one uh, suggestion I would like to make is, please don't keep your uh, slides crowded, okay? Uh, yes. Try to yes. lessen the number of uh, sentences for each slide, okay? You can, I think uh, you're well prepared. You don't ac actually need all those sentences written on the slide. Okay. Yeah, definitely. But I agree. I was just suggesting that uh, you can keep the minimum number of sentences to a slide. Then uh, you mentioned about the three major openings. How is uh, the opening of iota different from the other two? Iota is not uh, exactly present on the diaphragm, ma'am. It is present behind the median uh, arcuate ligament, ma'am. So what do you call that opening? Iotic. Yes. Uh, it's lying between a bone and a muscular component. So what do you call that? OK. Uh, you mentioned about congenital diaphragmatic hernia, right? Is there any other uh, uh, condition which almost mimics congenital diaphragmatic hernia? If you take an X-ray, it might mimic congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Eversion uh, of the diaphragm, paralysis of diaphragm. Yeah, what do you call that condition? Eversion. It's not eversion. It is extra, extra, extra version yeah. of a... Pardon? You're more close to it. It starts with E. Extravation. Second letter B. Even tration. Even tration. Very good. <laughs> okay. Nice attempt. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Test number four. Ma'am, that was test number four. There was a mistake in the name. So that was test number four. You can either leave the meeting or stay. Uh, so now you can unmute mute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, chest number five, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so I'll uh, give you a, a warning a warning call at seven minutes. Make sure that you don't exceed a presentation time of eight minutes, okay? Okay. Okay, I'll set the timer when you start presenting.
good evening i'm chest number 5 and my topic is cervical sympathetics the cervical part of the sympathetic trunk is present on either side of the cervical part of the vertebral column it is present in front of the transverse fossa of the vertebral column the neck of the first rib longus capitis longus cervicis muscles and the prevertebral fascia it is present behind the carotid sheath and the inferior thyroid artery the cervical sympathetics extend from the base of the skull to the level of c7 vertebrae it extends upwards into the cranial cavity as the internal carotid nerve and downwards it continues as the thoracic part of sympathetic trunk in the sympathetic the sympathetic nervous system has short preganglionic fibers which are cholinergic and long postganglionic fibers which are mostly adrenergic this is a cross section of the spinal cord the cervical sympathetics does not receive preganglionic fibers from the cervical segments it receives preganglionic fibers from the thoracic segments t1 to t4 although it does not receive from the cervical segments it gives off postganglionic fibers to the cervical spinal nerves the white, the preganglionic fibers are the white rami communicants the postganglionic fibers are the gray rami communicants the place where they synapse this distended part is called a ganglion ganglion is basically a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system so ideally there should be eight ganglia to correspond to the eight cervical spinal nerves but due to fusion there's only three ganglia in the cervical sympathetics the fusion of the upper four primitive cervical ganglia form the superior cervical ganglion superior cervical ganglion is present in front of c2 and c3 vertebrae it is the largest and it is spindle shaped the fusion of the fifth and sixth primitive cervical ganglia leads to the formation of the middle cervical ganglion the middle cervical ganglion is present in front of c6 vertebrae it is small and is sometimes absent the 7th and 8th primitive cervical ganglia fuse to form the inferior cervical ganglion the inferior cervical ganglion is present in between the transverse process of c7 and the neck of the first rib the superior cervical ganglion communicates with the crane of the cervical nerves 9 10 and 12 and also with the external and recurrent laryngeal nerves The middle cervical ganglion is connected with the inferior cervical ganglion by a loop. This loop is called ansa subclavia. Ansa subclavia rounds around the subclavian artery. Sometimes the inferior cervical ganglion is fused with the first thoracic ganglion which is present right below it. When they fuse they form the cervicothoracic ganglion or the stellate ganglion. so these ganglia in the cervical sympathetics they give rise to uh, three different kinds of branches one gray rami communicants to the ventral rami of cervical spinal nerves two a cardiac branch and three a branch to form a plexus around some artery the superior cervical ganglion gives rise to the gray rami communicants to the ventral rami of upper four cervical nerves it also gives rise to the internal carotid nerve internal carotid nerve forms the plexus around the internal carotid artery and a part of this plexus supplies the dilator pupillae the miller's muscle and some fibers from this plexus also contribute to the formation of deep petrosal nerve it also gives rise to the external carotid branch which forms a plexus around the external carotid artery it gives rise to the pharyngeal branch which takes part in the formation of pharyngeal plexus and then there's a cardiac branch the middle cervical ganglion gives rise to gray rami communicants to the ventral rami of c5 and c6 it also gives tracheal and esophageal branches and thyroid branches these thyroid branches accompany the inferior thyroid artery and then finally the cardiac branch which is the middle cervical cardiac branch the inferior cervical ganglion gives rise to gray rami communicants to the ventral rami of c7 and c8 inferior cervical ganglion also gives rise to vertebral and subclavian branches which form a plexus around the vertebral and subclavian artery respectively 
So this plexus around the subclavian artery is joined by some branches of the ansa subclavia. And then there's a cardiac branch. These cardiac branches, the cardiac branch from the superior cervical ganglion gives rise to two other branches, right and left. So the left goes and joins the superior cardiac plexus. The right branch joins a deep cardiac plexus. The cardiac branches from the middle and inferior uh, cervical ganglion goes to the deep cardiac plexus. Injury to the cervical sympathetic trunk leads to a condition called as Horner's syndrome. It is characterized by the following features. Mitosis is the constriction of the pupil. It occurs due to the paralysis of dilator pupillae. Anhydrosis is the loss of sweating on that side of the face. It occurs due to pseudomotor and vasoconstriction denervation. Partial ptosis is the partial drooping of the eyelid. It occurs due to, due to the paralysis of the smooth part of uh, levator palpebrae superioris. There is increased temperature and redness is also seen. There is loss of ciliospinal reflex. Ciliospinal reflex is uh, when on pinching the skin on the back of the neck, your pupil should dilate in a normal person, but here it does not dilate. Enophthalmos or sunken eyeball is also seen in Horner's syndrome. So usually Horner's syndrome is a result of some other clinical condition like Wallenberg syndrome. To summarize, the cervical sympathetics has three ganglia, superior, middle, and inferior. It gives rise to three kinds of branches, gray rami communicants to the cervical nerves, cardiac branch, and a branch to form the plexus around some artery. The ansa subclavia is a loop which connects the middle cervical ganglion and the inferior cervical ganglion. If the inferior cervical ganglion fuses with the first thoracic ganglion mm -hmm. below it, the, okay, thank you. the fusion forms a cervical thoracic ganglion. An injury to the cervical sympathetic trunk leads to a clinical condition called Horner's syndrome. Thank you. Okay, you presented the topic very nicely. Thank you. Okay, so let me ask you. Uh, you told me about the preganglionic fibers and the postganglionic fibers, etc. Any branches from these ganglia are preganglionic fibers contain preganglionic fibers? Um, can you repeat the question? These uh, superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia they get the fibers from the preganglionic fibers from the thoracic region, hmm. right? That you very nicely demonstrated. Now, my question is you um, uh, told many branches about this ganglia from this ganglia, arterial, visceral, uh, the gray rami, all these. Any of these does it contain the preganglionic fibers? Uh, preganglionic fibers to the. Not all these are postganglionic. Or all these are preganglionic? I think all these are preganglionic, only some exceptions. Uh... Like the ones going to the chromaffin cells of adrenal medulla are not post ganglionic. Uh, it's not. The, um, these ganglia is a site for uh, this relax, uh, the, the relay stations. They are relay stations, right? Yes, ma'am. All these ganglia, superior, middle, or inferior, whatever it be, it is a relay station. So that means the post ganglionic fibers start from these ganglia, right? Yes, ma'am. So naturally, all the fiber, all the branches arising from these ganglia should be should contain postganglionic post post fibers. And my question is: Is there any fibers that contain preganglionic fibers from these ganglia? Uh, I'm not, not sure, sure ma'am. No. Okay, okay. Then how is the head and neck region, the face region, get its sympathetic supply? Uh, the fibers from the superior cervical ganglion, it supplies uh, from the plexus around the, the carotid plexus. So through three these branches, you mean? Yes, ma'am. The plexus around the internal and external carotid. Okay. What is the reason for this Horner syndrome? When superior cervical ganglion is affected, 
if there is lesion in the sympathetic in the cervical sympathetic trunk it leads to corner syndrome okay what causes the loss of cilospinal reflex so when you pinch why is it not dilating because there is paralysis of uh, dilator pupillae Okay. Okay, it was really a nice presentation uh, with all sort of animations and drawings. Uh, well done. Uh, can you uh, mention the four uh, symptoms which we usually say for Horner syndrome? Uh, meiosis, anhydrosis, partial ptosis, and uh, anophthalmos. Okay. Uh, then, uh, what was the spelling written in your PPT for the first one? You mentioned about. Can you just have a look at your PPT? Horner syndrome. Oh, this is spelling error. Sorry, ma'am. It's a very big spelling error. Okay, it's not mitosis. It is meiosis. Okay. Uh, then, uh, which among the three ganglia is the largest one? Superior. Smallest one? Uh, middle. Okay. And when we mentioned about the medial branches, usually uh, for thoracic sympathetic ganglia, what sort of branches are they? For thoracic uh, sympathetic ganglia, medial branches are usually considered as? Can you name the thoracic. medial branch? Yeah. Uh, then how are the medial branches in the cervical ganglia different from? The medial branches of the thoracic ganglia. I think Amli Madam more or less asked something related to this. The medial branches of the thoracic sympathetic ganglia and the medial branches arising from the cervical ganglia. How are they? Can you just compare and say how they are different? Uh, I'm not sure, ma'am. Okay, just go and check. Anyway, it was really a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, just number five, we can either stay or leave the meeting. Uh, you have to mute yourself. Okay, thank you. Just number six, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so I'll give you a reminder at seven minutes. Make sure that your presentation does not exceed eight minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll set the timer once you start presenting your screen. We can start. So, uh, good evening everyone, respected teachers. I'm Parvati and my today's topic is facial nerve in the face. So, as we all know, facial nerve is a seventh cranial nerve and it is a nerve of the second branchial arch. So, uh, it is a most commonly paralyzed peripheral nerve. Now, we'll deal the topic under the following headings. First, about the functional components, its nuclei, cores, branches, clinical anatomy, and the surface marking. So, first, the functional components. So, the major component is special visceral efferent, which uh, gives innovation to the muscles of facial expression and also to the muscles which elevate the hyoid. Then we have the general visceral efferent, which give parasympathetic secretory motor supply to the submandibular, sublingual, nasal, palatine, and pharyngeal glands. Then there is the uh, special visceral efferent, which takes taste sensations from the uh, anterior two-third of the tongue, except the circumvallate papillae. Then there is a small component of general somatic efferent, which takes sensations from the skin of the ear. And, and this is not... Uh, through the direct branches of facial nerve, but through its communications with the other cranial nerves, especially the trigeminal nerve. Now about the nucleus, uh, it is lies in the lower part of the pons. It has uh, four nucleus. One is the motor nucleus or the branchiomotor nucleus. Then there is the uh, sensory uh, nu nucleus, that is the nucleus tractus solitarius, and the superior salivatory nucleus, which is divided into the salivatory and the lacrimatory nucleus, which is parasympathetic in function. Then a brief about the intracranial cores of the facial nerve. Uh, after rising from this nucleus, it enters into the internal acoustic meatus along with the eighth cranial nerve, that is the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then it enters the facial canal in the vitreous part of temporal bone. 
and then it leaves the skull at the stylomastoid foramen. Now uh, it enters into the uh, face by passing lateral to the base of the styloid process at the posteromedial surface of the parotid gland. And then it transverses horizontally along the anteromedial surface of parotid gland. And when it reaches behind the neck of the mandible, it divides into its five terminal branches, which emerges out from the anterior border of the parotid gland. Now, within its course in the parotid gland, it lies between the superficial and the deep part of the parotid gland above the retromandibular uh, vein that is superficial to the retromandibular vein and the external carotid artery. Now coming to its branches, it gives branches in the facial canal, namely the gator petrosal nerve, the uh, nerve to step periods and the scotty tympani, and also branches at its extent, exit from the st stylomastoid foramen. But now our focus is on the, te the terminal branches, namely the temporal, the zygomatic, the buccal, the marginal mandibular, and the cervical branch. It also has communicating branches to the other cranial and spinal nerves. Okay, now at the anterior border of the parotid gland, it gives off its five terminal branches and they emerge out in the shape of the feet of goose. So that is called pes ancerinus. Now uh, the facial nerve actually divides first into two divisions, a temporofacial division, which gives out the temporal and the zygomatic branch and a cervicofacial division, which gives off the buccal, the uh, marginal mandibular and the cervical branches. Now going to each of the branches in detail. So first about the temporal branch, it crosses the zygomatic arch and supplies the muscles in the forehead and in the uh, lateral and anterior aspect of the external ear, namely the auricularis anterior, auricularis superior, now the intrinsic muscles in the uh, lateral aspect of ear. And also in the forehead, it supplies the frontalis part of occipital frontalis, the orbicularis oculi and the corrugator supercilii. Now, the zygomatic branch, it crosses the zygomatic bone and it supplies the uh, lower part of orbicularis oculi. Then you have the buccal branches. There are two buccal branches, an upper buccal branch, which passes above the parotid duct, and this supplies the muscles in its vicinity, namely the muscles of the nose, the nasalis. Then you have the zygomaticus major, zygomaticus minor, and muscles of the upper lip, the elevator labia superioris, the elevator labia superioris alkinasi, and the elevator anguli oris. Now you have a lower buccal branch, which will be uh, passing below the parotid duct. And this mainly supplies the buccinated and the orbicularis oris. Now coming to the fourth branch, the marginal mandibular branch, it goes forwards behind the angle of the mandible and the platysma. It crosses the body of the mandible to supply the muscles in the lower lip and the chin, namely the depressor anguli oris, depressor labia inferioris, rhizorius, and mentalis. Now you have the cervical branch, which emerges out of the apex of the parotid gland, goes downwards to supply the platysma in the neck. Now coming to the clinical aspects. First, the Bell's palsy. Now it is a lower motor neuron type of lesion of the facial nerve. Now uh, its cause may mainly is due to the compression of the facial nerve when it exits the stylomastoid foramen. Now uh, the etiology of this is not well known, but probably it is due to a viral infection. Now the clinical features of uh, patients are there will be facial asymmetry due to the unopposed action of the muscles of one side, of the unaffected side of the face. Then there will be widening of the palpebral fissure and an inability to close the eyelids. Now, this is due to the uh, paralysis of orbicularis oculi. Then there will be epiphora, that means tears will flow down, that is due to the paralysis of lower part of orbicularis oculi. Then there is the loss of the nasolabial furrow, which is due to the paralysis of elevator labia superioris alkinasi. Then there will be loss, mainly there will be loss of the horizontal wrinkles of the forehead due to the paralysis of the frontalis part of hospital frontalis. Then there will be accumulation of foot in the vestibule of the mouth due to the paralysis of buccinator. Tripling of the saliva from the ankle of the mouth due to the paralysis of orbicularis oris. Then... Uh, there will be less amount of resistance when we press against an inflated vestibule. This is because of the paralysis of buccinated and in the patients of Bell's palsy, the air will leak out through the lips. Now, we told that Bell's palsy is a lower motor neuron type of lesion of the facial nerve. So what's the difference between the lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron type of lesion for the facial nerve? The uh, new part of the nucleus of facial nerve that supplies the upper part of the face. They receive the corticonuclear fibers. As you can see this diagram, they receive the corticonuclear fibers from the cerebral hemispheres of both sides bilaterally. 
whereas the part of the facial nucleus that innervates the lower half of the face that receives nucleus only from the contralateral cerebral hemisphere. So in case of an upper motor neuron or an supranuclear lesion, this will um, cause paralysis. Now, it will not cause paralysis in the upper part of the face, but cause Excuse only in the seven minutes over. Thank you. Only on the contralateral lower half of the face. Now, in case of lower motor neuron lesion, both the upper part and lower part of the face of the ipsilateral side will be paralyzed. Now, the facial neuron palsy of the newborn, it is a condition in which as a newborn, the mastoid process is absent and the stylomastoid foramen is not well developed. So uh, the manipulation of the head during the delivery will cause defects to the facial nerve. This will damage the sucking of milk of the newborn due to the paralysis of buccinator. Now, the other sy syndrome is a crocodile tear syndrome that is lacrimation during salivation that is due to the aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve fibers involving uh, trauma of the geniculate ganglion. Now, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is due to herb suster in involving the geniculate ganglion. Now, uh, we have this surface marking. First point will be um, a midpoint of the anterior border of mastoid process and second point is behind the neck of mandible. Thank you for your patient listening. Pavali? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's a very good presentation. Thank you covered a lot of things. Now, you told me a, uh, you know, I told about a plane that passes through the carotid gland. What is its relation with other structures that uh, passes through the carotid gland? Uh, it has a retromandibular vein in the external carotid artery. And the relation of First, uh, uh, most anteriorly you have the facial nerve, then you have the retromandibular vein, and then the external carotid artery. Is it most anterior? Is it all these are related in this uh, parotid gland from anterior to posterior? From a superficial to the deep aspect. Okay, either it is called superficial to deep or it is called from lateral to medial. Okay. 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 Is there any plane for this? Uh, passage of this nerve and vein in the parotid gland, which is very important surgically. Is yeah, we, uh, Hilton's, uh, we do the incision yeah. in the Hilton's method. Um, now, my another question is, in a facial nerve palsy, can there be hyperacusis? Yeah, ma'am. If the palsy is uh, is just to be after the geniculate ganglion, the nerve to step areas will be paralyzed. So that can cause hyperacusis. Okay. Okay, it was a nice presentation. Uh, Thank you. One of my suggestion is uh, you are actually uh, figuring the entire thing on your face. And I was looking for the marker on the face. <laughs> Okay, so you can use a pointer and uh, you can show the diagram. Okay, and only in the middle, I noticed that you were showing everything on your face rather than on the PPT. So if you're having a PPT, it's better to point on the PPT. Okay, you can just use a pointer or something like that to show the branches and all. Then uh, have you heard about rule of 17? Something with facial now. You mentioned a lot about uh, all these paralysis. The deviation. So, have you heard about the rule of 17 on 7? No, ma'am. Sorry. It's a combination of 10 plus 7 and 12 plus 5. Can you correlate? It's very, very important when you go to the clinics. Okay, you can have a look. Then, uh, regarding the UMN palsy, you mentioned about the UMN palsy, right? Uh, do you know the syndrome with which it is mentioned? If you have a human palsy, you call it as central seven syndrome. Have you heard about it? So what do you mean by central seven syndrome? Central seven. Uh, the, uh, the paralysis of the fibers above the facial nucleus, supranuclear lesion happen, and that will cause the paralysis. Why is it called central seven? Uh, the fibers coming from the uh, cortex is lesioned. Okay, have a look. 
Anyway, it was really a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bhavati, you can either stay or leave the meeting. Okay, judges, uh, shall we uh, continue the symposium or a break okay. needed? Call the next question. Okay, so uh, chest number seven, am I audible? Yes, I'm. Yes, you're audible, ma'am. Okay, so uh, your time will start when you start when you start presenting your screen. Yes, ma'am. Okay, at seven minutes. I'll give you a reminder. Okay, ma'am. Make sure that you don't exceed a time of eight minute presentation. Yes, ma'am. You can start presenting your screen now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Roshan Raj, and I have taken the topic of, uh, and, I, and I'm going to talk about the topic of arterial supply of cerebrum. So, what makes arterial supply of cerebrum so essential? See, brain is a vascular organ with such high metabolic rates. So, it so it needs constant uh, uh, supply of glucose and oxygen. So, during an acute interruption of blood flow to the brain, for more than a few seconds, it can lead to permanent neurological damage. Now, before going into the topic proper, let us first uh, talk about the uh, circle of Willis. The circle of Willis is present in the subarachnoid space and it is formed by two systems, the internal carotid system and the vertebral basilar system. We can see the vertebral vein, which is joining at the lower border of pons to form the basilar vein, which is bifurcating at the upper border of pons to form the posterior cerebral vein. And the internal carotid artery, which is going to divide into the larger middle cerebral artery and smaller anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery are going to have a communicating branch and uh, a communicating branch from the internal carotid artery comes to the posterior cerebral artery, that is the posterior communicating artery. So this is the basic uh, si uh, architecture of the uh, hexagonal uh, uh, circular arteriosis. Now, uh, uh, now let me go into the topic proper, anterior cerebral artery. Uh, all arteries to the uh, brain are of two types, are of three types, I'm sorry. Uh, central, which is meant to penetrate the brain and uh, innervate the internal structures. Um, uh, the choroidal, which is meant to pierce, uh, pierce, supply certain structures and go to the, go and form the choroidal plexus. Finally, the cortical arteries, which form a network in the pia matter, give short and long end arteries. Um, now, let us start with the anterior cerebral artery. Now, each artery, I'm going to talk about its cores uh, that, and its branches. Anterior cerebral artery, it starts, uh, I'm, I'm able to show you here, it is, it's starting at the internal carotid artery. And after starting at the internal carotid artery, um, it goes in front of the optic nerve and it goes to, and it goes to the uh, greater cerebral fissure. At the greater cerebral fissure, it gets a communicating branch from the opposite side. The part of the artery from its beginning to the communicate, communication is A1 and the, and the part distal to the communication is A2. Here we are going to see two important cortical branches. The first cortical branch is the anteromedial group, which is going to supply structures such as corpus striatum, anterior limb of, uh, anterior limb of internal capsule, and mediostriatal arteries. Mediostriatal arteries are meant to supply the uh, thalamus, thalamic structures. Uh, A2 continues in the greater cerebral fissure. Here in this diagram, I'm able to show you the A1 part and the, and the A2 part. The A2 part in turn divides into pericalosal artery, which is, which is at the callosal sulcus, and the callosomarginal artery, which is present in the uh, sing, uh, cingulate sulcus. This um, pericalosal artery is considered to be the A3, and older literature says the pericalosal artery is further divided into A3, A4, A5. Now, additionally, now let us talk about the important uh, Scott, uh, important structures supplied. First, I'm going to talk about three three uh, uh, broad man's areas, 9, 10, 11, which form the prefrontal cortex, which plays a role in individual's personality. And then uh, six, that is the premotor cortex. Four is the primary motor cortex. And three, uh, three, two, one, uh, three, one, two are the uh, primary somatosensory cortex. All these structures present on the medial side are meant for the lower limb and the perineum. And then we have the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery now is divided into four parts. We know it's already the great, it is the bigger branch of the internal carotid artery. And from its commencement to its bifurcation is known as M1. From its commencement to its bifurcation is N1. It bifurcates into a part of the artery which enters into the lateral sulcus. 
and a part of the artery which goes away from the lateral sulcus the part of the artery which goes into the lateral sulcus is m2 away from the lateral sulcus is m3 and this and it gives further cortical branches um here on the upper part of the image i may, we are able to see the inferior uh, the blue color uh, the, uh, the blue color part supplied by the middle cerebral artery that is nothing but the temporal pole and the lateral part of the orbital surface of the frontal lobe in in the superolateral surface we are able to see the blue color line that is the central sulcus and two green color lines the and the two ramae that is ascending and anterior ramus of the lateral sulcus now uh, the part um, of the middle cerebral artery which enters into the posterior ramae of the lateral sulcus is going to supply the whole red surface now uh, there are many there's a lot of variation so let us see all the broadman's areas which are getting supplied 44 45 which are nothing but the uh, broca's areas which is meant for explorative speech the 8 which is the frontal eye field meant for conjugative eye movements the 6 which is the the 6 which is the premotor and 4 primary motor 3 2 1 somatosensory primary somatosensory all three for the part of the body other than the lower limb in the perineum 7 and 5 uh, which is the 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 sensory recognition areas 40 39 present literature is present literature says 22 40 and uh, 22 40 39 all form the uh, sensory speech area of wernicke 41 42 the primary auditory area and old literature says 22 is the audit secondary auditory area now we were talking about the cort uh, cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery now let us talk about the um, <clears throat> now let us talk about the um, uh, central branches of the middle cerebral artery the major central branches are the lenticulostriate branch arteries we can see the lenticulostriate artery which is supplying the internal capsule cordate nucleus putamen and globus pallidus posterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery um, is further divided into three parts the first part there's a contradiction in which part is what but uh, according to gray's anatomy the first part is from its origin to its um, Uh, communicating branch from distal to the communication uh, up to which it end up to the lateral sulcus it is um, up to the lateral sulcus is part 2 and after it once it has entered into the tentorial surface it is part 3 now let us see its uh, now even there is a considerable amount of variation in its branching so let us see the broadman's area it supplies area 17 the primary visual area or the white striae area 18 and 19 secondary visual areas usually corresponding with visual memory uh the etorhinal cortex which is um, etorhinal cortex which is the which is a part of the olfactory area now we were talking about the three cerebral arteries and their uh, um relation and their cortical and as well as cortical as well as um, central branches It's now let us talk about the two minutes over now let Thank us talk you. about the two uh, two choroidal arteries the anterior choroidal artery posterior choroidal artery both of, both of which are going to supply certain structures and they are going to uh, Uh, they're going to form the choroid plexus occlusion of a1 part of the anterior choroidal artery is going to be asymptotic unless and until as a congenital um, malformation the occlusion of the a2 part usually results in apathy because of the prefrontal cortex urinary incontinence because the perineum motor is present perineum motor control is in the paracentral lobule and uh, as stereognosis sometimes because uh, sometimes 5 and 7 broadman areas are involved and para and uh, mostly paralysis of the leg muscles or that on the contralateral side uh, just a short story that was uh, the, the discovery of all this came after a person named philips um, sorry phineas gur cage got uh, uh, a big uh, rod pierced into prefrontal cortex and his character completely changed now middle cerebral artery uh, first uh, the frontal eye field may get affected so the eye uh, the eye deviates to the side of where it's affected contralateral hemi anesthesia and hemi uh, hemiplegia Uh, broca's aphasia or wernicke's aphasia uh, now present treatment for broca's or wernicke's aphasia is if they then is basically melodic intonation therapy wherein if a person may not be able to speak the word he wants in broca's aphasia he can sing the word he wants now last Sorry, the occlusion you exceeded the okay uh, the occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery usually involves uh, mitral sparing and uh, the mitral sparing of the uh, contralateral homonymous hemianopia yes Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you are gone very extensively into the topic. Eh? 
very mm-hmm. wide and depth into the topic that is why i think the 8 minutes are not at all enough for you mm-hmm. <laughs> to express whatever you know but it is a very very nice attempt because you have mm-hmm. uh, gathered everything that has been given the text that is uh, the most advanced hmm, knowledge mm-hmm. of uh, all these concepts you try to incorporate okay mm-hmm. uh, okay uh, how will you investigate Uh, you, you told initially some you have shown some MRI or what what was that? How will you uh, normally investigate the arterial occlusion or something like that? Um, in stroke, first we'll go for plain CT to identify ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. If hemorrhagic stroke, decompression surgery. If ischemic stroke, we can go for diffuse weighted MRI. Okay. Then is the the cerebral branches? Is it supplying only the uh, the cerebrum or is it? Uh, In ma'am, addition uh, to the cerebrum, is it supplying anything else? Yes, ma'am. Along cerebral arteries, they supply the in, uh, the inner uh, structures of this, inner structures, the inner oh, white matter of the cerebrum. Uh, internal capsule, parts of thalamus, corpus striatum. No, apart from brain, is it supplying anything? Apart from brain, maybe certain meningeal branches. Maybe certain meningeal. Meningeal uh, branches. Ah, uh, is it which meninges? Which So you are telling that these meningeal branches are all branches from the cerebral arteries? Uh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. They are. They are they usually in the. No, no. They are not branches of cerebral arteries. So the meningeal meningeal branches are from. Um, they are either from the directly directly from the circle of villus, or they are from any uh, anastomosis present. Mm, okay. Then you told something about the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery, the first part that leads into the lateral, the stem of the lateral sulcus. Yes, ma'am. Then the first part. The second part. The first part uh, is. The first part is from its origin up to its bifurcation. Okay. Or trifurcation. After bifurcation, what happens to that segment? The second part goes into the lateral sulcus. The third part goes away from the lateral sulcus. Away from lateral sulcus means to where? Uh, um, to come, uh, in, to come, it it breaks up into cortical branches to supply the medial side and the inferior inferior surface. Okay, then which part is is it? Uh, any part of this is going to the insula? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. The the third part is also called insular part. Okay. What is central sulcus? No, what is circular sulcus? Sorry, no, not central. What is circular sulcus? Circular sulcus. Um, okay, not related to your topic. Then, okay, Rose. Okay, a very nice presentation. I think you have prepared a lot, but due to time constraints, you are not able to present it completely, right? Mm. Okay, so you know about the two circulations: the anterior circulation and posterior circulation in the brain. Anterior mm. circulation comes from uh, the uh, the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, I am not able to understand. Alone. No, we broadly divide the circulation inside the cranial cavity into anterior and posterior cir- circulation, right? Mm-hmm. Anterior cerebral circulation and posterior. So, anterior mm-hmm. comes from anterior cerebral and parts of middle cerebral. Any part? Um, What about the remaining part? Um, it goes to posterior circulation. I am not very sure. Uh, have you heard about uh, carotid siphon? Yes, ma'am. What's the significance of carotid siphon? It uh, it's used for detecting any pathology in the pituitary. You use it? How? Uh, to find if petro- if pituitary is engorged, uh, the carotid siphon we ca- we can identify it with the carotid siphon. It, um, Only if the pituitary is enlarged, you have some use with the carotid siphon. Ah, uh, it can it reduces the pulsations in the int- intracranial por- portion. It reduces. The pulsations in the intracranial portion. The pulsation. What will happen if there is any block in the internal carotid artery? Block in the internal carotid. Is there artery. any lateral circulation established? In the internal carotid. Internal carotid yeah, artery. Yeah, the other internal carotid artery is there, so that the circle of bliss may take over. If so. It said that in circle is right is have maintaining its own portion and left is maintaining its own portion. But ma'am, when there is blockage, there'll definitely be shunting of blood, no ma'am. 
if both the internal carotid arteries are blocked how you establish the collaterals between the internal and intracranially i'm not sure but extracranially the inter, internal carotid external carotid in the brain sir well, that's my question is there any collateral system established for the survival of brain mm. is there any communication mm, i don't know ma'am okay anyway thank you mm, thank you right sir is he has he gone beyond the time period yes ma'am 39 seconds amli madam Uh, okay, we can note it. Um, so, um, shall, I call, shall I tell the next one to present? Yes. Okay. Uh, Test number eight. Test number eight. Am I audible? Test number eight. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, 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 you are audible. Okay. Like okay, so uh, I'll give you a reminder when it's seven minutes time. Okay. okay, make sure that you don't exceed at the presentation time of eight minutes. Also, um, I'll start the time when you start presenting your screen. You can start presenting your screen now. Thank you. So hello everybody. This is chess number eight, Highland Jesse, and let's get into our presentation now. So can you find out this pouch which is marked with red color markings here? And uh, can you just guess it? It's nothing but the hepatorenal pouch, and that's my topic today. And we'll be dealing about it in the upcoming slides. So first, hepatorenal pouch is nothing but a subphrenic space. So what's a subphrenic space? That we'll be dealing in the next slide. it's just a potent uh, hepatorenal pouch is just a potential space which is not filled with any fluid normal in normal condition this space becomes visible when there's fluid accumulation into it and it's about 30 to 40 ml and in this picture you can see liver above and right kidney below and this is the region where mortensen's pouch or the hepatorenal pouch is filled with fluid this is an usp and what is a subphrenic space these are potential spaces in the close proximity with liver they are present below the diaphragm and that is why the name subphrenic so these are classified as intraperitoneal spaces and extraperitoneal spaces intraperitoneal spaces are the right anterior the right posterior the left anterior and the left posterior spaces and the extraperitoneal spaces are the right extraperitoneal space and the left extraperitoneal space in our slides we will be dealing with the right posterior intraperitoneal space in detail this is nothing but our hepatorenal pouch so it has got a number of other names like morrison's pouch right posterior intraperitoneal pouch right subhepatic space rutherford morrison's kidney pouch these are its other names so it's just a potential space which is situated between the right kidney and the posterior inferior surface of the liver so it was named after the british surgeon james rutherford morrison now a hepatorenal pouch is the largest and the deepest subphrenic space so it's the most common space uh, or the site of subphrenic abscesses and in supine position it is the most dependent part of the peritoneal ca cavity above the pelvic rim so this is the hepatorenal pouch shown here now let's go to the proper anatomy uh, first we'll deal with the boundaries so anteriorly there is the in uh, inferior surface of the liver along with the gall bladder posteriorly there is the upper part of the right kidney the hepatic flexure the right suprarenal glands then the second part of the duodenum some part of the head of the pancreas superiorly there is the inferior layer of the coronary ligament and inferiorly it's just open to the exenteral peritoneum so now where all does it communicate on to the left via the epiploic foramen it goes to the lesser sac and along the inferior border of the liver it communicates to the right anterior intraperitoneal compartment so let me tell you a fact if there's any kind of uh, infection in the hepatorenal pouch it can actually reach the pelvic cavity uh, especially to the recto uterine pouch via the paracolic right paracolic gutter because it uh, connects these both regions and that is why if you have any kind of uh, uh, infection in hepatorenal pouch it also affects the pelvic cavity 
and in case if there's any abscess in the right posterior or the right anterior intraperitoneal compartment uh, the pus is prevented from entering the other compartments by the formation of adhesions between transverse colon the greater omentum and the inferior border of the liver so this is a picture that shows the hepatorenal recesses uh, uh, here the fluid gets drained in supine position so now from the facts that we have just studied let me give you a clinical correlation just consider a patient who is suffering from fever with chills and rigors pain and tenderness in the right hypochondrium pain in the right shoulder so the ultrasonography of the abdomen looks just like this can you give me a differential diagnosis from the facts that we've just learned it's subphrenic abscesses and you can see morrison's pouch being filled with abscesses here so now let's see something about the subphrenic abscesses few points just in brief so this is the second most common intraperitoneal abscess following pelvic abscesses and how does it actually reach the subphrenic region during expiration your intra abdominal pressure falls down and due to capillary action and the upward movement of your diaphragm the fluid that's collected in your peritoneal cavity moves upwards towards your diaphragm and that is how subphrenic abscesses are uh, uh, located or just reaches the subphrenic regions now these subphrenic abscesses are very common in the right side of your body why is it that so because it's in your right side of the body which is greater in infective conditions uh, are common there for example your appendicitis and in case maybe your liver uh, will uh, give out uh, abscesses during some kind of liver problems and also you have the right paracolic gutter there which is wider and deeper which also facilitates a uh, greater incidence of subphrenic abscesses in the right side of your body now in case if any infective organism is actually the cause of the subphrenic abscesses uh, and that too if the organism can form gases for example clostridium then your abscess will not only contain pus it will also have gas in it and therefore during perforation you will feel uh, it is it is resonant above the liver dullness region and now let's briefly very briefly look at some points of subphrenic abscesses causes include the appendicitis following surgeries perforated duodenal ulcers in case of intestinal obstruction features are fever chills tenderness all these could occur all these occurs because there is pus formation inflammation and due to some kind of infection so the investigations that are made uh, could be made for this include ultrasonography and the ct scan these are for the diagnostic purposes which is shown here this is an ust and this is a ct scan showing some subphrenic abscesses and the treatment include providing antibiotics and the drain, uh, draining the abscesses that has collected into the peritoneal cavity so this is another image that's showing some diagnostic features of this subphrenic abscesses and that's the end of my slide and thank you all for your patient hearing and thank you for this opportunity thank you Hi, Lin. Yes, sir. This is a very small but very important topic, very clinically and anatomically important, and you have presented it very clearly, very nicely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So my question is: Is that space, a hepato, that uh, hepatorenal pouch or Morrison's pouch, is it there normally? So oh, it's actually a potential space. Now it can't be seen using UST if there's no fluid collection into it. Only if there's a fluid collection of a little amount of fluid collection into it. It gets visible in the UST. Otherwise, it's just visible. Uh, okay. Yes. So, if that pouch is visible, that means that there is some problem, right? Yes. Okay. Now, tell me. Uh, you told me there is a site of fluid collection, and where are these fluids come from? These fluids, in case if your GIT or the peritoneum, uh, if there's peritonitis or any kind of inflammation in any regions of your GIT, then the peritoneum gets filled with fluid. so during uh, yeah, when the intra abdominal pressure decreases and uh, due to capillary action and the movement of diaphragm upwards the fluid will have a tendency to uh, what is this fluid what ma'am sorry ma'am i can't hear what produces this fluid what is the uh, origin no. of this fluid due to infection there will be a pus formation and such kind of abscesses Okay, my question is: Is it from the abdomen, the viscera affected, or is it from the peritoneum? Is it produced by the peritoneum or directly from by something else? 
produced from the peritoneum when it is get, when it is getting infected ma'am okay okay bro in your hand it's a very nice presentation um can you name the investigation which is done uh, on bed side usually in trauma what happens is when the patient is bedridden uh you can suspect for this hepatorenal pouch uh, getting collected with the fluid isn't it can be hemoperitoneum or whatever so can you name the investigation the special investigation done in order to recognize the condition ultrasonography ct yes, scanning yeah ultrasound uh which is a bedside investigation because you need to decide on laparotomy right if there is a collection so but there is a particular name given to that investigation using ultrasound then usually after uh, trauma bedside i don't know the particular name okay then uh, you mentioned about the space being connected to the which is a uh, which is the other space connected through the right uh, paracardial artery uh, it uh, goes to the uh, recto uterine pouch okay if you get a collection in the left subtrenic space will it be connected no because the left uh, paracardial artery no i think it's no because the right uh, left paracardial gutter yes no left left paracardial gutter also connects to the uh, pelvic region okay. but it's not wider and deeper enough as the right one no 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 my question is whether there is a connection between the left subtrenic space and the right uterine pouch similar to the one which you discussed right now i think yes no you need to check because if you get a collection in the recto uterine pouch if you are not getting any um, anomaly or any trauma or uh, any injury in the pelvic region you have to suspect which side left or right that's my question right side right side Then, not left i think there's no connection there or so which structure prevents the connection uh... and that's okay. it anyway nice presentation thank you thank you thank you helen uh, you can either stay or leave the meeting ma'am shall i call chest number 9 okay okay chest number 9 am i audible yes you are audible okay so uh, i'll give you a reminder when it's 7 minutes make sure okay. that you don't exceed your presentation does not exceed a time of 8 minutes Sure. Okay, so I'll start the timer when you start presenting your screen. Okay, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, so you can start now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, respected judges and my dear friends. The topic I've been given for today is inguinal canal. The inguinal canal due to its complex anatomy, embryological development and numerous contents is of high clinical significance and it gives rise to several pathologies. Let's look at the anatomy. So it's actually an oblique intermuscular passage which can uh, which extends from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. Uh, the deep inguinal ring is an oval opening in the fascia transversalis uh, which is present 1.2 cm above the mid inguinal point. The superficial inguinal ring is a triangular opening in the external oblique aponeurosis present above and medial to the pubic tubercle. If we draw two parallel lines connecting these two points of about 4 cm length, we get the surface marking of the inguinal canal. Let's look at some of the boundaries of the inguinal canal. So the anterior wall is formed by skin, superficial fascia, external oblique aponeurosis in the entire extent. and in the lateral one third we see the muscle fibers of the internal oblique muscle the posterior wall is formed by the parietal peritoneum fascia transversalis in the entire extent in the medial two third we see the conjoint tendon and in the medial most region we see the inguinal ligament which is not shown here the roof is formed by the internal oblique muscle which arches over it as well as the transverse abdominis muscle the floor is formed by the upper grooved surface of the inguinal ligament and in the medial most end we see the lacuna ligament so the contents of the inguinal canal are the spermatic cord in the male 
round ligament of the uterus in the female and the ilioinguinal nerve in both sexes. It is important to note that the ilioinguinal nerve does not enter through the deep inguinal ring. Instead, it comes through a slit between the external and internal oblique muscles and leaves the canal through the superficial inguinal ring. The spermatic cord is covered by three facial layers, external spermatic fascia, cremastric fascia, and internal spermatic fascia. Its contents are three arteries, uh, testicular artery, cremastric artery, and artery to the vas deferens, three nerves, genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, ilioinguinal nerve, and autonomic nerves, as well as three other contents, which are the vas deferens, pampiniform plexus of veins, and the lymphatics which drain the testis. Now, the presence of the ilioinguinal nerve in the lateral part of the anterior abdominal wall makes it a site of weakness and herniation can occur through here. But there are some mechanisms which prevent this from normally happening. The first mechanism is the obliquity. So the superficial and the deep inguinal rings are not present directly opposite each other. Rather, they are present obliquely. So when intra-abdominal pressure is increased, the anterior and posterior walls get approximated and obliterate the canal. This is known as the flap valve mechanism. The next mechanism is the shutter mechanism formed by the triple relation of the internal oblique muscle. It forms the anterior wall, the roof, and the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So when it contracts, the roof gets approximated to the floor and obliterates the passage. The next mechanism is a slit valve canal uh, mechanism, which involves a superficial inguinal ring. So it's a triangular opening, as we said, and these two sides are known as the crura, which are formed by the external oblique aponeurosis. When the external oblique muscle contracts, the two crura get approximated. The ball valve mechanism is formed when the cremastric muscle contracts and the spermatic cord is pulled up, so it plugs the superficial inguinal ring. Finally, we have the guarding mechanism, where the deep inguinal ring is guarded in front by the internal oblique muscle and the superficial inguinal ring is guarded from behind by the conjoint tendon and the inguinal ligament. Hasselbach's triangle is present in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Its boundaries are the lower part of the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle, laterally the inferior epigastric vessels and inferiorly the medial part of the inguinal ligament. This is the region where direct inguinal hernia can occur. So inguinal hernia can be of two types, indirect and direct inguinal hernia. Indirect is usually seen congenitally, so in infants and in children, whereas direct is seen in middle age and older age. So this picture shows left inguinal hernia. Here we can see that the herniation of the bowel loop occurs through the deep and superficial inguinal ring into the scrotal sac and it has an oblique passage. It is present lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. So this is an indirect inguinal hernia. Whereas in this picture of the direct inguinal hernia, we see that it is caused due to a weakness in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. It does not come out through the deep inguinal ring. And it comes out medially to the inferior epigastric vessels. Clinically, the way we differentiate between these two types of hernias is by a test known as the ring occlusion test. So first, we reduce the hernia, which means we compress it so that it goes back to its original position. Then we occlude the deep inguinal ring, which we know is 1.2 centimeters above the mid inguinal point. Mm -hmm. We then ask the patient to cough so that the intra abdominal pressure can be increased. If we do not see a bulge, that means it is an indirect inguinal hernia, as the bowel loop cannot herniate through the occluded deep inguinal ring. So this is known as a positive ring occlusion test. Whereas if we do see a bulge on the coughing, then it means that the occlusion of the deep inguinal ring has no effect on the herniation, meaning it is a direct inguinal hernia. So it is a negative ring occlusion test. There are certain risk factors that predispose to hernia, such as male sex and older age. Some complications are irreducibility of the hernia, obstruction of the hernia, which means that the neck becomes narrow and the bowel contents are not able to pass forward. In severe cases, the blood supply to the herniated loop can be cut off, causing strangulation and ischemia, which is a surgical emergency. Certain pathologies are also related to the embryology of the inguinal canal, and we must know two structures. So the first structure is the gubernaculum testis, which is a fibromuscular cord, which helps in the descent of testes in male. Uh, the second structure is the processus vaginalis, which is a peritoneal fold which, which invaginates into the canal. 
So at birth itself, the upper part of the processes vaginalis should uh, close and the rest should be obliterated. Non-descent of the testes into its adult position in the scrotal sac is what we call cryptochidism. It can occur at any level down its descent, but 75% of uh, cryptochidism or undescended testes occur in the inguinal canal. The treatment for this is a procedure known as orchidopexy. This picture shows hydrocele of the cord. Seven minutes. Thank you. Seal of the cord, which is a fluid collection in the inguinal canal. So this is because of incomplete closure of the uh, processes vaginalis. Finally, this picture shows varicocele, which is a dilution of the pampaniform plexus of veins. We say it has a bag of worms appearance. So in conclusion, the inguinal canal, which extends from the deep to the superficial inguinal rings, is of high clinical importance because of its anatomical and embryological intricacies and because of the different contents that it has in males and females. The most important condition with relation to the inguinal canal is the inguinal hernia. These are my references. Thank you very much. Okay, the presentation was very crisp and clear. Thank you. Okay. Then how do you differentiate it from a femoral hernia? It also can be seen as a swelling in the um, that inguinal region. Femoral hernia does not bulge on coughing, ma'am. Won't bulge? Ma'am? It won't bulge? Um. Okay. Then you told us something about conjoint tendon. Yes, How is it formed? Uh, ma'am, by the fibers of the uh, transversalis, uh, fascia transversalis, as well as the internal uh, oblique muscle. Is it a fascia transversalis? Uh, uh, sorry, ma'am. Transverse is abdominis muscle and the internal oblique muscle. Okay. Okay, I think you have presented it very clearly, nicely, and all these mechanisms which prevent uh, everything has been covered. Very good. Rose, anything? As Abhinandan said, the uh, presentation was short and crisp. Um, you mentioned about cremastic muscle, right? Yes, ma'am. From where it is uh, originating? Uh, it's in the scrotum, ma'am. It's an extension of the uh, external spermatic. Sorry, the um, the fascia, but the Collie's fascia, ma'am. Campus fascia, campus fascia. From which point? My question is, from where it is taking its origin? It's from the superficial fascia, ma'am. You are going somewhere. We we were talking about it as a content of the inguinal canal, right? Yes, ma'am. Is it a content? Uh, is it a content in females? No, ma'am. It's not there in females. Cholesterol muscle. Not sure, ma'am. I. Is it present in females or not? Not sure. No, ma'am. If present, where, where will you look for it? In the inguinal can labia majora. Labia majora. The cremastic muscle is not there for females in the inguinal canal. You are saying like like that? I'm not sure, ma'am. Okay, please have a look. Okay. Yes. Then, um, if the hernia contains Meckel's diverticulum, what do you call that hernia? There's a particular name given to that hernia. Not sure, no. And what about testicular vein? Is it a content of inguinal canal? Uh, in testicular vein, ma'am? No. It is in the uh, plexus, no. The pampaniform plexus is present in the... What is testicular vein? It's not present in the inguinal canal, ma'am. It goes... What is testicular vein? How is it formed? Formation, I'm not sure. Okay, then you mentioned about the superficial inguinal. Madam, do you want to ask? Me? No, 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 no. You should the testicular artery is there. So, what about testicular vein? Not sure, ma'am. Okay. okay, superficial inguinal ring, you mentioned about the two crora, right? Yes, ma'am. Is there any third crora? I mean, third crest? 
the base is formed by the pubic crest man no, no no you mentioned about two crora is there any third crest for the superficial inguinal ring i am not aware of any third crest man. go and refer all these points these are very interesting topics of discussion when you come across the inguinal canal okay thank you ma'am okay uh, can i either stay or leave the meeting <laughs> Are you trying to join using a different device too? Test number ten. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Yes, I'm using and the laptop. In the laptop, I'm signed in, but the mobile is not good. Your audio, it's not clear. Uh, let me try to rectify this. Test number ten. One minute. I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> Okay, see, uh, you join using your laptop, right? Test number ten. Hi, I'm I on. But uh, okay. Am I audible? You ready to go? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So, um, I'll give a reminder when it's seven minutes. Okay. Make sure that your presentation does not exceed a time of eight minutes. Okay. And I'll start the timer when you start presenting your screen. Okay. Okay. Can you try presenting your screen? Shall I start? Okay. Yes. Is it coming? Is it visible? Hello. Ma'am, is it visible to you her screen? Can you see? Me? Screen? I don't know. I can see both screens share her image. Okay, so is it the same now one? Now. Wait, I'll try to join. I I don't know what. You join using your laptop, right? You have to start screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wait a Sorry for the delay, ma'am. It's the last one, right? Yes, ma'am, last one. <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I think she is doing a PowerPoint presentation, sir, right? Yeah, yeah. She knows about you're doing a presentation, right? She knows about it now. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I can leave my uh, I think it's not supposed to timed out of trying to meet it. Can I get the link again in my mobile? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You can rejoin again. You can leave the meeting now and you can rejoin. Hello. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm trying to log in using another. I think she is having some connectivity issue also. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, okay. Um, uh, see, um, you John using your laptop, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I've joined. Now you have to turn on screen share. I've started screen sharing. Can you see me? Can you see me? Is my screen visible? Ma'am, um, can I see your screen? Hello? Your screen is not visible. We can see you. Is my screen visible? No. No. Uh, but I've started screen sharing already. <laughs> Okay, I'll try another. Is my screen visible now? Is my screen okay. visible now? Wait, do you have the same PowerPoint in your phone? Uh, Lenita, do you, I mean, Blessed, do you have the same PowerPoint in your phone? Yes, I have, yes. Okay, so try joining and using that and then you screen share. Okay. Uh, Raisa, I think you can ask me to send the PPT to you and you can do the screen sharing while she presents. If she's not able to. Okay. You can send your PPT to me. Can you see screen? It's still not visible. You do one thing. You send the PPT to my number, phone number. Uh, can you see now? Can you see now? No. I think oh, yes, I think there is some connectivity issue for her. Hello, I don't know why it's a single one. I don't think I'm going to do that. Can I send the PPT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can send. I think no, she can share. share now. Okay, click on the PPT now. Ah, oh, yes. Here in mobile. You can. Is it okay? You can. Screen is, screen is visible. You please take your PPT. And you can present. Present. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready to go? Can I start your timer? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, just number ten. Okay, so I'm going to start. Okay, you can start now. Ah, uh, so the topic given me was cavernous sinus, and uh, let's go into the topic. Uh, uh, first, let me start at the topic with an interesting. Case study here. So, the, uh, while you watch this video over here, I read the case. A 22 year old man complained of eye lid swelling. I 
vegetable decrease and occasional headache accident post which he experienced a head injury he was initially thought to have a glaucoma but finally he was diagnosed with a ccf based on magnetic resonance imaging so what is the ccf and why was he thought to have glaucoma uh, maybe what you saw in the video a pulse that miss that so he had green screen pulsating the screen is not seen and then also please um all the is not there other associated let's see uh, conditions in this movie so what is cc get can video um let's so see how is um, my can topic? stop that's what it's excuse me so the point hearing session at uh where am i first point the location and extent next is the my relations which talk about the structures let's try to communicate with them yeah Hello? Okay, ma'am. Uh, yes. Okay, am I audible, Blasi? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you stop presenting now? Actually, your screen stopped presenting. Wait for two uh, minutes. We'll make an arrangement. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. The thing is, uh, you your need to stop presenting. Yeah, your screen is not breaking. Oh, okay, fine. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, bless you. Listen, send your PPT to Divya, who gave you this link. Okay, she will press it. Am I audible? Okay. I think Raisa, her uh, network yeah. is too slow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. 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 We can move to a different place so that a better net availability will be there. It will be okay. It will be good. Uh, but I, I can get. But but I'll have to. Audio is it okay? Your audio, video, everything is breaking in between. Ah, uh, but the video. The thing is, our notifications no, also turned off. She can't uh, see the messages. Sorry. Is it? Did you? Do you have a video? Just it's okay. You leave the video. Can you continue with the presentation? You either do that or you send the presentation to Divya who gave you the link. No, I am seeing. Can you can you send your PPT to Divya? And the thing is, I'll try that. And I think she probably has a video within her presentation which is not able to play. I think all this because of the network. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I. I'm trying to come one Um, I think she'll soon send it to Divya.
one minute. Oculomotor nerve 
and then the trochlear nerve uh, and then the ophthalmic nerve which is the first branch of uh, trigeminal nerve and then the maxillary nerve the second division and you can see here uh, the third division of the mandibular nerve is also there but it is not a uh, relation to the lateral wall next going to the um, structures passing through cavernous sinus first is the internal carotid artery surrounded by the sympathetic plexus this is the same sympathetic plexus which supplies the ciliary ganglion and then we have the abducens nerve which is the sixth cranial nerve so you can see the involvement of uh, the third nerve fourth nerve and the sixth nerve which explains the ophthalmoplegia in the first case we saw so it's something thing the um, fractured second uh, uh, nerve hemoplegia and the um, um, pulsating effects of thalamus is due to the uh, abnormal communication between the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus over here so that is the carotid of cavernous fistula um, we go to the tributaries uh, i've explained the cause of the Uh, conditions seen in my first case now the tributaries tributaries it receives mainly from the orbit meninges and the brain first from the orbit uh, it is the superior ophthalmic vein you see here and then the inferior ophthalmic vein you see here and the third one is the central vein of retina over here next is the tributaries from the meninges uh, first one is the sphenoparietal sinus and then second one is the anterior trunk of middle meningeal vein next one tributary from brain and uh, the first tributary is the superficial middle cerebral vein and second one is the inferior cerebral vein which is not shown in this picture but uh, it is uh, present and then uh, communications coming to the communications first is the transverse sinus you see here it is it communicates with the uh, cavernous sinus through the superior petrosus sinus which is shown here next one is the internal jugular vein uh, it communicates with the cavernous sinus through the inferior petrosus sinus and then the pterygoid venous plexus Uh, we know a plexus is formed on the uh, lateral or lateral side of uh, teri lateral pterygoid muscle uh, that communicates here so the uh, it communicates through the emissary veins um, from the foramen ovale foramen lacrimum etc and the facial vein about which i'll talk later and then the opposite cavernous mm -hmm. sinus so you can see uh, it Uh, communication here in uh, and then the superior sagittal sinus over here and it communicates to the superficial uh, middle cerebral vein and the superior anastomotic vein and then internal vertebral venous plexus uh, the may, uh, the clinical aspect of this cavernous sinus is the cavernous sinus thrombosis uh, which includes thrombolytic phlebitis and uh, septic process is uh, mainly infection and then aseptic process trauma extra and then and after the development the third screen and the same pain in night is all it So the involvement of ophthalmic impaired vision, the pick, and then the dangerous area. So all things to the sinus may arise from this angle over the skin to address the. There are two to the cavernous vein. First one is the angular vein, superior to the cavernous sinus, to the deep facial vein, even this, and then the emissary vein. The most of the angular vein, superior ophthalmic vein, 
communication and next we have the ocular sinus symptoms by the ophthalmologist मैम Okay, it is nothing to do with you. I think the next issue is there. Ah, uh, but you have gave a nice try because your slides are very good. Ah, uh, the pictorial representation, the case presentation, everything is good. Yeah. Okay. Nothing much, uh, Rose. Anyway, uh, the same thing for, uh, from my side also. Your presentation was really nice, but due to some the network issue, we couldn't hear you well. Okay, but the slides were again very good. Uh, so, can you just uh, say something about uh, how you get exophthalmos okay. in carotid cavernous fistula? You started with that, right? What is the reason? Uh, yeah, exophthalmos is because. Uh, Uh, the blood supply will be increased in the ophthalmic vein, so it will bulge out, and uh, there will be also edema in the eyeball outside. Okay, will you call it as blood supply increasing or something else? To say it is blood supply, it should be arterial. Uh, increased uh, hydrostatic pressure. Mm -hmm. Venous drainage. I think. Sorry. What is the condition of pupil in the uh, this condition? What is the condition of pupil? Pupil. Uh, pupil will be affected because uh, our optic nerve is not involved. Optic nerve is not involved, so uh, I don't. Think will it be constricted? Will it be dilated? Will it be responding to? Will be affected. Okay, I think it. Ah, oh, okay. You can wind up, right, Rita? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can wind up now. Uh, just number ten. It's okay. I know it's due to a connectivity issue. That's okay. Okay. So um, you can unmute. Uh, you can mute yourself of your video. Okay. Uh, so uh, that was a that was the last participant. Uh, with this, we have come to the conclusion of symposium. Dams met meet. Uh, Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank our dear judges. They have been here when without a break for more than two and a half hours. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ambly ma'am, and thank you, Rose ma'am. Uh, and also sorry for the technical delay caused at the end. And um, I'd also like to appreciate uh, all the participants. We had fifty-three entries. All fifty-three entries were equally good, and it was a tough decision to take ten. And also these ten finalists for all the efforts they've taken. Thank you for responding. such enthusiastically to our program and supporting us so with this uh, i can i conclude the event the results will be declared soon thank you